So, um, uh, as you heard, I serve a joint appointment with the California Strawberry Commission and the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. Just a little bit of background. So, the California Strawberry Commission, state agency, represent all the growers, processors, and shippers in California. Um, we do marketing, uh, public policy, and research. So, I serve in the research area. And then the Cal Poly Strawberry Center, located on campus at Technology Park. Um, and we have in these regions here, we have about three acres of strawberries right next to our offices at, at Technology Park there. And uh, we focus on uh, plant pathology, etymology, and uh, automation. And today we're going to be talking about automation. Um, and in particular, um, we're going to be talking about technology adoption. So my background is in engineering, but we're not going to talk about engineering. We're specifically going to talk about technology adoption. Um, so first, you know, uh, in a nutshell, um, California strawberry production comprises of these stages, breeding, nursery, uh, growing, shipping, and retail. Um, and you're seeing technology enter each of these stages. Um, so uh, over here, you see uh, Google X over here at, at Cal Poly Strawberry uh, Fields taking a, um, a phenotyper, trying to understand uh, the plant architecture and um, the spatial temporal changes uh, in the plant as it grows, optimizing it. Um, we also have um, uh, operations in our nurseries. Uh, nurseries are in the northern production. Um, we don't care about fruit or blossoming over there. We're just trying to store all the energy into the plant. So you can, uh, right now we actually um, uh, take those, those fruits and, and, and blooms and we take them off by hand. And there's, uh, the nurseries are trying to automate this right now. Um, so we actually have this uh, vacuum suction that, that mulches the, the material. Um, so then you, have, uh, then you also have um, our current uh, bare root. Bare root's the plant that goes into the ground. So in the nurseries, once it's grown, they pull it out and then they start shipping it to the growing regions in the, in the south. And right now we do quality assessment by hand, um, all up, uh, uh, as you can see here. And then now they're trying to uh, use automated uh, uh, sorting, um, automated defect rejection, essentially. I'm trying to identify uh, what are good and healthy plants just using machine, machine learning. Um, so uh, you can see how um, it's permeating from the genetics to the, to the nurseries. Um, you also have uh, harvest aids. Um, you have autonomous uh, platforms following uh, uh, workers around. Um, they, you can see this system here, it's a pretty simple, um, just a, a sonar system that's following these workers. And then they can, uh, instead of having to run to the end of this 300 uh, foot bed to get to the end uh, and, and, and drop off their trays, they can have their platform follow them around. Um, you also have not just harvest aids, but you have automated harvesters. Um, this is uh, uh, trap. This is Traptic. Um, basically, they, uh, this is from Silicon Valley. CEO or founder was uh, Lewis Anderson. And you can see their system going through the fields, uh, picking fruits, and then putting it into bins, um, and then uh, 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 allowing for the, the, the pickers to come in the next day to uh, um, pack it. Uh, this company was then later acquired by Bowery Indoor Farm, so now they're only focusing on indoor uh, strawberry production, uh, which is also kind of interesting. Um, you have, uh, so that was out of Silicon Valley. You also have Harvest Crew out of Florida. Um, this is Florida production here. Um, and uh, essentially, you're also working on harvesting. Um, so you can see them as they, they use a different, you know, one you saw this uh, multi-axis arm, and this one you're seeing this custom-built um, uh, uh, um, uh, robotic end effector, this, this, this arm system here, which circles the plant. So everyone's having their little bit different approach. Um, you also have right out of uh, Sacramento in, in California, Advanced Farms. It's probably got some of the most news recently uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the space. Um, but then you can see how their approach is. They also built a custom arm um, on a rail. And uh, essentially, they use a, a suction and, and a twisting motion to replicate um, the human being as they, as they, as they uh, break off the strawberry from the, from the stem. Um, and they also put it into bins, and then they have the bins ready for the workers as they come in in the morning. Um, so those are aids and harvesters. We also have um, pest management approaches um, where you have these uh, predatory mites, this persimilis, which we, we kind of salt shake onto the plant currently and uh, uh, all by hand, as, as you can imagine. And then right now we're trying to, uh, uh, there's companies out there trying to uh, use drones to 
disseminate these particles across the field. Um, so, uh, and then there's other types of pest management as well. Um, so you have uh, UVC technology, um, which uh, does uh, pest and disease uh, control by, uh, they typically they have like an autonomous vehicle because it has to be performed at nighttime. It does, um, uh, it actually damages the DNA of, of, of um, many of the pests and disease that affect our, our, our commodity. And uh, uh, that's why they have this um, uh, uh, autonomous. Um, and then from pests and disease, you also have uh, post-processing. So you have your, um, in the processing plants, um, you have strawberries going in and they're being uh, decapped, removing the, the leaves, the, the calyx off of the fruit so it can be uh, jammed, juiced, and, and jellied. Um, so all or, or quick frozen and, and such. So you can see these systems are um, uh, starting to, to permeate. And this is all new. Um, you know, in the last, let's say, five to seven years, uh, this has all been taking place. So it's pretty uh, frontier in terms of the amount of adoption. Um, and then you have uh, um, Amazon working on the retail side, looking for a uh, quality assessment, basically trying to uh, help out the, uh, the supply chain, trying to minimize waste and, and increase um, a shelf life. Um, so you're seeing all these, uh, um, you know, activities happening in the space. You might wonder, like, you know, why strawberries? So this was a, a, a talk. Um, you can check out the, the YouTube um, uh, for the entire, the entire speech. But this was a, a prolific entrepreneur, Kyle Cobb of Advanced Farms. You saw the machine um, a, little, a few slides ago. Um, but he did an analysis. You know, this is how... So I use this as an example of how entrepreneurs approach the space. We did an analysis and found that the addressable market for berries um, was high. Um, the grocery sales, the demand um, for this, uh, this, this product was high. And the amount of uh, expenditure on labor um, was high. So as a result, um, berries typically become a pretty high target for, for entrepreneurs to start to, uh, um, to, to work on. Um, and just to give you a little bit, these are 2019 numbers. Um, and then just to give you a little bit uh, uh, more emphasis on, you know, um, how much in demand this, this product is. Um, in 2020, um, no one was really sure what was going to happen. But, you know, interestingly enough, the, uh, within uh, fresh fruit, within the, uh, the category of, of berries and their competitors, um, strawberries uh, grew double digits, um, and it grew uh, substantially uh, compared to uh, uh, its competitors. Um, so it was, it was kind of unique. Uh, you know, again, people wanted to eat fresh. Um, retail uh, or, or service sector decreased, and then everyone went to groceries. So in general, grocery sales increased, but um, in particular, every time you know, there is a, a mention of um, uh, health. Uh, it seems like berry prices started to, uh, berry consumption started to increase. So then is this 2020, is this a unique scenario? And we found that 2021, it continued, you know, double digit growths again with strawberries. So then uh, uh, it seems like this trend starting to last, um, you know, just more consumption of fruit. Um, and then when you're looking at the USDA uh, numbers, the most recent 2021, um, uh, strawberries have been at about, in California, strawberries have been about $2.3, $2.2 billion uh, a year in terms of um, uh, production value for probably uh, uh, 20 years now. Um, so uh, just this year, it's gone up to $3, $3.1 billion. Um, so you're seeing a, a significant change in the, in the entire industry. So that's just to show... Um, demand, you know, like in the time of crisis, um, people went to berries and they went to strawberries to, um, to, to, to soothe them. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, in particular, uh, California, California produces 90% of all the, fr of all strawberries uh, in America. Um, they're all located uh, in, in a, uh, on the coast and it's about 300 mile stretch. Um, and then uh, strawberries, in terms of the berry market, strawberries is about 60, 65% of the entire berry market. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so not, not only is it just in California, but um, in particular, this is that 300 mile stretch I was referring to. But in particular, these three small little dot regions are, um, uh, are really where majority of the strawberries come from. So you're getting the, uh, this, it, there is no more, 
the, this is the, the most uh, productive region of strawberries in the world, and there's this really, um, uh, because of microclimates and, and, and soils and, and such, there, this, it's really, uh, these are, these are going to be the, the most productive uh, going, in the, uh, going in the future, um, you know, w without uh, huge changes in, in climate. Um, but, so you're seeing highly focused production. Um, and then you also have, this is another talk by our, our cooperative extension director um, who does the, the UC Davis cost studies on our, our commodities and did analysis on in terms of the uh, general cost to produce strawberries, um, the amount of labor used, as, as we saw earlier in the slides, the, the labor was uh, significant. And when you're looking at here, it looks like labor is about 50% of, of the entire production cost. Um, so then you have this uh, extremely valuable um, commodity, uh, this, this product. Um, it's highly uh, geographically concentrated, um, and then there's uh, um, over 50 or roughly 50 percent of the cost is to labor. Um, so that combined with um, the increasing amount of funding into um, ag tech, um, you're seeing that uh, uh, all these activities start to, to spur out all those, um, those videos we saw earlier. And just to give you another kind of, you know, some of those things that just uh, uh, gives you a, an indicator that, that, that what's happening is, is true. Um, you know, in the uh, Q4 2021, this was um, the robotics and smart field equipment um, investments. Just in, this, uh, in the, last, uh, the last quarter of record, um, two companies um, are dedicated to strawberries only. Um, and, these, and these companies uh, raised in this quarter or so, in the last uh, year or so, they raised about $65 million just to work on strawberries. And then uh, a lot of these other companies, they also have strawberries within their target line as well. And this, is, this, this total map represents about $1.3 $1 billion. Um, and all of this stuff you can kind of follow up on and, and learn more about at, at ag tech conferences, and there's a lot of them. In California alone, um, you can probably go to an ag tech conference every month if you like and, um, and learn something new. And there's always, there's always um, more conferences popping up and, uh, uh, and more stuff to, to, to discuss. Um, so the point that, you know, that uh, I'm trying to make is that you know, um, essentially uh, robots are here, technology is here, and uh, uh, you know, how are we going to uh, uh, you know, uh, deal with it? Or how are we going to adopt it into our, into our production practice? And uh, if, if any of you have gone to recent uh, conferences, robotic conferences, you've probably seen quite a bit of these um, displays here. And spot right now, um, the the yellow dog is uh, is currently scanning orchards, um, so it's starting to permeate into into the agriculture sector. Um, so, again, how do we how do we approach technology? Um, so, something that's common uh, when working with entrepreneurs uh, is that everyone kind of more or less quotes this this, Hen this Henry Ford uh, saying, um, "If I ask if I ask the people what they wanted." He would have said a faster horse, and uh, and for us, you know, uh, it's quite profound. But uh, uh, we f we commonly find that entrepreneurs interpret this as uh, uh, I don't need to listen to my customer because they don't know what they want. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we think that that actually will lead to folly, and, and we've we've seen that lead to folly uh, uh, many occasions. Um, we like to think that, um, you know, another way to interpret this would be uh, you know your customer so well that you can, um, uh, you know what they're going to want. So you have to listen to your, your, listen to the farmer, you know, to, to the extent and, and uh, to an extreme extent. And to us, you know, that's in the, in the, the California Strawberry Commission and the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. Um, that's what we think our secret sauce is. Um, so... Things that we learned is that you really have to listen to the grower and uh, you have to build products that meet them where they are now. So we try, and again, you know, our uh, role or our, our target here is, is trying to have deliverable products within the three to five year time frame. So a grower says, I want it, and then they can buy it in three to five years and adopt it. Um, so, um, you know, with that in mind, um, this is kind of uh, uh, our approach. Um, so, and then, you know, other areas that we learned, um, you know, 
commonly when, when growers and, and the conversation of technology comes about, uh, they typically, everyone says the first question is speed. You know, how fast can your machine do this? And then they start um, running the calculations and building, you know, um, minimum viable products and such. The second thing that kind of gets overlooked is precision because the grower, when you work with the grower, they kind of um, take for granted how precise their human uh, manual process is. Um, so when they talk to technologists, they just they, they don't ask, like, can you do human parity? Can you meet us to exactly the same product output that we're getting now in the field? Um, and then, uh, uh, so that kind of gets overlooked. And, and in each of these lessons, is million dollars lost um, in, in past experiences. Um, and then adaptability, which is almost never talked about, um, where uh, essentially I have a human crew, and that crew can do anything I really want to do at any, at any point in time. And does your machine, for instance, you know, if it, um, uh, if it uh, let's say, picks the fruit, um, does it do quality assessment and packing? Does it do all three stages of it? Um, can I also use them to clean the field later? Um, so uh, does your machine do all that? Or are you only taking out a single, a single task and, and a, a single task that, that can't be um, uh, you know, compartmentalized? It, it can't be disassociated with the entire process. So that's also something that, that gets overlooked quite often. And what I mean by adaptability is, um, you know, to get further into it. Um, so this was a, another talk by um, an executive of a, a strawberry farming agency. Um, they do, they do growing, shipping, and processing. Um, but they they took a, a look at, you know, this was just a year, and they found that the amount of revenue generated on the tail ends um, was the most significant. There's reasons why you have to um, still produce fruit during the uh, the lower price market. Um, just to uh, maintain relations with your, your, your grocery, um, um, your retail sector. Um, but, you know, looking at the tail ends, you know, based on that, they changed where they grew, right? They changed uh, what region, those three dots that you saw earlier, um, they changed going from a northern production going to a southern production because they could hit more products in this area um, and, and potentially generate more profit. Um, so when you think about that, that was a decision based on customer um, customer demand, and then they changed their grow practice, the the the, the grow structure. Um, instead of four lines of strawberry, uh, two lines of strawberries, they went to four lines or three lines of strawberries. Um, so it, uh, the genetics that they use, all of that changes um, just based on um, the the market um, the market demand at the time. Also, in terms of, uh, this was also part of this talk, um, you know, in terms of what plastic you use, you know, different colors of plastic can uh, heat the earth at, at different temperatures and produce it and allows you to release your product at different times in the market. And this is just another area of control that the grower has to, to try to, you know, see what's coming and, and try to adjust accordingly. Um, you also have a bunch of uh, soil disease, um, depending on what's out there. You know, you might have to choose the appropriate genetic. You definitely have to choose what genetics you're going to be planting and where you're going to be planting just based on your soil disease. Um, so that's, a, you know, your, your soil micro, um, uh, microbiome. And then just your, in general, you know, your brand. Um, uh, if you're trying to expand your brand and trying to land new distribution centers across the states, you know, you, there might be, uh, there's definitely going to be new uh, constraints and, and, and uh, specifications from your retail partners. Um, they're going to say maybe there's traceability requirements now, or now there's a certain look, a packaging that needs to be uh, taken into account, or... Uh, possibly, um, you know, of course, perishability and, and even how it's packed, you know. You might want to pack it, what we call face packing, with all the strawberries looking at you in a line versus kind of like a, a, a jar of marbles. Um, so each of those are going to affect um, your brand. So, you know, the, the, the questions are, are constantly, can your technology adapt to all of these uh, man, uh, maneuvers that the, that the grower goes through on a, on a, on a season basis? Um, so just to summarize, you know, what we see is that the grower, when they start to grow strawberries, they have certain levers and controls, um, and they're trying to go through these uh, really unpredictable events. Um, you know, you can kind of have a forecast, but, you know, in, in farming, you know, this, you really have to uh, 
for us in, in horticulture in this type of um, high intensive crop, you really have to be able to maneuver. And then so you want to ask, does your technology, does it decrease the amount of control that the grower has? Like I can't use a certain type of genetics now, I can't use a certain plant spacing, or now there's, um, I have a larger canopy and there's more occlusion because plants are now uh, you know, adjacent and overlapping with one another. Um, and now I can't use the technology, or um, does your technology actually give the grower more control? And uh, uh, does, it, does, it, does the grower now have more options to do you know, more things as they start to go through their, their, their season? Um, and what we found is that the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the latter here is actually more successful. Um, and of course, you know, the growers go through all of this um, primarily because, uh, you know, every year they're, they're concerned about can they make profit. And of course, uh, if you're a grower, every year you're also concerned, like, are you going to be in debt? So it's the difference between profit and, and debt. Um, so just as an example, um, Ligus bugs. Um, so Ligus bugs, they, uh, they do about $200 million of damage in our industry each year due to misshapen, um, uh, misshapen fruit. So the ligus eats the seed of the strawberry and then it causes a sharp strawberry to kind of close in on itself. And it looks like what we call a cat face. Um, it just looks like a, a misshapen fruit. Um, so uh, the first thing that, the, uh, first thing that we uh, did on the commission side, we've been working on this problem for probably about like 12 years now from a bunch of different perspectives, a bunch of different approaches. Um, the first thing was uh, 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 that we that we learned was that growers they typically follow they they have three things that they do they try to avoid the problem completely um, which you know kind of makes sense because if you talk to the grower and you and you really you really try to narrow it down they want the profitability of the strawberry you know uh, industry but without the risk of growing strawberries well, fundamentally that's 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 what it comes down to. So if they can, they'll try to avoid doing anything, but still try to um, get some of the return. And then they'll try to buy the problem, um, and then they'll typically try to build the problem themselves. It's usually in that order, and it sometimes um, uh, sometimes it, it changes. Um, but so the first thing that they did was that they surveyed the industry, or the first thing that the commission did was we surveyed the industry, and we identified that second-year crops, crops that, that, um, that usually at the end get mowed down and then, uh, get brought back up. They were um, a, a breeding ground for these ligus bugs. Um, so once the growers understood that, they found that out, the first thing that they did was they said um, uh, about 88% uh, uh, of growers said, okay, then uh, they're going to uh, essentially enforce that no other grower that's next to them can grow second year crop. So that's the, 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 the kind of the area of avoid, just like just stop. Just stop doing that practice. You know, it's not. It's. It's. You're not really benefiting, and it's causing more harm to the industry as a whole. And they kind of policed each other. Um, and then this this uh, this process went through. Uh, you know, three years or so. And then now, a uh, few individuals, uh, at least anyone in the mid or large size, uh, uh, growing strawberries, uh, grow second year crop. And then the the next area is that they started to do mechanical methods, so a non-chemical approach to pest management. They had this Ligus vacuum, which was built about 10 years ago, which was in yellow, and then this, uh, this silver, what we call the double barrel bug vacuum, which was bit, built here at Cal Poly by Cal Poly students and professors. Um, and what we did is essentially, um, they, they found that the yellow version, uh, although inefficient, which we'll talk about, um, still was able to manage ligus. And then so um, the Cal Poly professors and students basically deconstructed the old version and then optimized it. And then as a result, they were able to get um, about two times more airflow using the same tractor. And then it removed around three to, to two, two times more ligus um, off the plants. Um, and then from there, you know, um, we just released this through cooperative extension and, and, and other, other uh, areas. Essentially, you can see grower standard, the yellow version, 13, Cal Poly's version, 33, 6, 21, 10, 28, in terms of how much light is removed. So it's fairly significant. Um, publications, jur uh, standard journal publications, websites, YouTube tutorials, we, uh, we worked with uh, the existing um, uh, distribution network to, to make sure that, that the growers could purchase it from their uh, preferred manufacturer. 
And then we also released all the, um, the designs online so that um, if the grower wanted to manufacture or fabricate it themselves, they could, or if they wanted to maintain or, or find part replacements, et cetera, they could. Um, so, and then this was also featured in um, um, the CSU system um, as well as uh, uh, trade magazines. And then within the one year of, of the release of this technology, um, uh, about 20% of the industry on average adopted it w within the first year. And, and really the hurdle was they were waiting for their yellow machines to obsole uh, obsolesce. And then there, were also, um, uh, there was also bottlenecks due to, to supplies and, um, and components um, due to the supply chain. Um, but uh, we expect to see 100% um, adoption within five years based on the, the, the current trend. Um, so that was, uh, you know, a project that took about, you know, two, two years or so. Um, and then a grower wanted it. They said, like, this is our biggest problem, and then they could, they could buy it. And that kind of gives you a, a little bit of an idea of how the technology got adopted. But now this looks, it's, it's pretty much, you know, standard out there now that this double barrel, and then there's also a different version in, the, in, in, a, in a different grow system called the single barrel. It's pretty standard now, but, you know, some, some questions that, you know, I'll start to ask the audience, um, you know, why other versions of this system didn't get adopted, just to nail home, you know, what, what we think technology adoption takes. So another version of this is, is, is right here. And, you know, maybe uh, ask the audience, you know, why didn't this version get adopted? You know, thinking from a grower's perspective, understanding uh, all the controls that they needed to go through in, in their production practice, um, uh, why wasn't this one adopted? I guess anyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's... One of the things, maybe, it, it, it's hard to see. Exactly, yeah. yeah. If you think about the operator perspective, and I think... Uh, op um, often overlooked um, when you think about 50% of the, of the costs are labor and the labor force required to, to, to the, your labor force is your main uh, profit generator they, they generate all your revenue because you're, you're, um, uh, you're picking your fruit and then uh, to think about um, how your labor force is going to use this uh, technology is really important, you know, um, getting, you have to get buy-in from your labor force. They, they have, really the grower works for their labor, their labor staff at this point, given how much, um, how much uh, uh, funds that go towards the, that expense. But yeah, being able to see, but also, you know, this isn't street legal. You know, you're not able to drive it across from one farm to another farm, so you have to station it at a single farm. It also, um, you know, you can see like uh, the material gets sucked up into this container here, but then, then the operator, what are they going to do with all that debris? Now you added a second stage, you know, how do you dispose of that debris? Um, and, uh, and are you just going to add more, or add more tasks to, to the operator? So then you have things like that, and then you also have, you know, different systems. Everyone tried to, to produce a system. Um, you have a backpack bug vax, um, obviously is you know not 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 tenable and scalable means. Um, these two systems, they they kind of look like yeah, growers would adopt it um, from an engineering perspective. You know, we're not we're not talking about engineering, but these are these are inefficient. But um, from a grower's perspective, you know, it kind of seems like okay, it's light. I can maneuver. I can I can get around. Even internally at Cal Poly, when we were designing it, um, you know, we knew that if, if we could make that tube a little bit longer, we could even increase the airflow even more. Um, but uh, as a result, you know, talking to growers and getting that constant iterative feedback, what we learned was essentially, and, oh, and then we also tried three, three vacuums as well. Um, but what we learned when we talked to growers was because of the, the layout of their land, how much the, the topology and the, uh, um, the inclinations and, and cutouts, how narrow these roads were, everyone needed something that could fold and, and be able to maneuver uh, uh, on their farm. So that kind of limited us to um, a certain footprint to, 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 to get this thing actually adopted. So then you can see here how, how compact it actually is. So we had to use two vacuums because we could stagger it in a way that uh, could fold better. Um, so um, things along those natures, and we, we would love to have this to be a little bit longer uh, in terms of uh, how, how tall this tube is. Um, but again, you know, we're limited by the constraints of the grower. Um, so, uh, and then that, you know, as that started to take off and, and really started to demonstrate to the industry that um, not just 
the growing industry, from, but the entrepreneurial side, um, that, hey, technology can make it in, in ag. Um, then we have, uh, uh, they have models to go off of. Um, so this is, this is uh, bug vacs have been used for, you know, five, five plus years um, on, on a wide scale basis. So this was a, a talk by the uh, UC Cooperative Extension Director. Again, they spend about um, $1,100 an acre to operate this uh, piece of machinery. And then um, they do that now regularly. And you can imagine that's, on, that's an additive thing. It's on top of what they currently do. And it doesn't interact with, it doesn't uh, bottleneck any of their other production practices. And then one from there, then you can start to see like other companies start to come out like with autonomous um, bug vacs, you're saying, okay, it costs about $1,100 an acre. Now that number is sound. Now we can start um, seeing if we can't, now we can, essentially the growers educated enough to um, put together what their capital costs could be if they integrated a new, more sophisticated piece of technology. So now there's companies coming out there with autonomous um, uh, bug vacuums um, to try to uh, take that, that $1,100 cost and uh, um, service the industry. So now another example here we have um, is uh, uh, spray rigs. Um, so this is basically trying to get uh, distribution cover uh, coverage and uniformity across the field with your um, your, your 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 chemicals. Um, so um, this was the grower standard, and this was the uh, the Cal Poly version designed here. Um, so the main thing is that what we did was that um, we eliminated some of these drops. We found out you didn't need as many um, no, um, hoses, and, and then the number of nozzles we cut in half because we found out the, the coverage of uniformity and, uh, um, and the uh, 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 coverage and uniformity were about the same. And you could actually get further, deeper penetration in into the canopy using less nozzles. So maybe this is another, um, another question, you know, uh, do you think like this technology would, uh, would get adopted into the, into the industry, you know, similar to the bug vac? Yeah, I pose it out there. I'm going to ask a lot of questions, by the way, so <laughs> feel free to start marinating. Um, so, yeah, the, what we found here, what was interesting was that, you know, what we, we did the same process as the bug vacuum. Um, you know, we released the numbers. We found that um, grower stand, some growers, there's a lot of different growers out there. Some growers, the, their spray rigs, you know, we're outperforming them by 30, 30 plus percent. And, uh, um, and it looks like the rig was, was doing fairly well. Um, and then we also published it in journals, did online tutorials and, and websites um, with uh, all the components so growers could adopt it. Um, but, we, but what we found in this case was that, you know, the makeup of the industry, this was kind of twofold. The makeup of the industry, there is a, a subsection, you know, let's say the bottom quartile, um, really could use um, um, some, some benefit there. And in the bottom quartile, they, they, they adopt the technology. Once they see it, they say, That's, that, that makes sense, you know, um, less nozzles, it's cheaper, it's easier to uh, maintain and calibrate. They probably had some issues with that, which is why they were, you know, in that, that, lower, that lower quarter. Um, but then the ones that were in the, uh, in the middle and in, in top regions, they felt like, you know, it's not, the, the cost isn't really worth changing. Like, I, I've been doing it, I've kind of always been doing it. You get to that point where it's like, avoid. Like, I'm just going to avoid doing anything new, you know. It kind of, you, you can't really demonstrate that it's, it's doing significantly better. So, even though it costs more, harder to maintain, you know, I'd rather just continue to do what I'm doing. So that was, a, you know, an interesting thing. And, and also the other fold here is that, you know, back to that labor question where you're, you know, training your labor. Um, uh, these spray operators, you know, they, they uh, because you're trying to minimize turnover because the, the, your, your operation is so reliant on, on well-skilled and highly motivated um, labor, um, uh, essentially, uh, they develop a, quite a bit of ownership uh, with regards to their, their spray system. So then it also becomes difficult to, to change that. Once they, once they have, um, uh, you know, it feels like it's part of their, their added value to the, to the company. Um, so, and then uh, one of the other main lessons learned was evaluation criteria. The only way to evaluate that the, um, the coverage was better and more uniform was through um, water-sensitive uh, paper. Um, uh, there are other means, but it was, it was less tenable. Um, e each of those may be more, more sophisticated, more accurate, but um, just becomes costly and, 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 
and hard to hard to um, uh, uh, perform the experiment. But what we found was about it takes about 80 spray cards and probably a team of like four to five people to put them out in the right amount of time to assess the rig. And when you think about that, you know your farm advisor, your PCA, um, the grower, um, no one's really going to do that. It just it's too costly and it's too it's too much uh, uh, effort to, to go about that. So because you know most most people that we talk to, they'll put out two spray cards, and two spray cards with the noise that you're going to see is means nothing. Um, so uh, uh, you know, with that in mind, you know it's difficult to to assess um, the 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 output, and then because it's difficult to assess the output, it's hard to get adoption. Um, so this is another example. This was probably like 2002. Um, uh, what we talked about a little bit earlier, and you saw in those earlier videos, is that the standard process before 2000 um, was essentially um, a harvester. Um, uh, they would have to uh, go through the field. They pick quality assessed pack, put it into the flats that you see at your, your grocery store, all in the field, and they would run it across a 300-line sprint to the end of a, 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 a bed. And then they would um, um, put it to the, uh, qu um, the quality checker. Um, and then what they started to say was like, okay, well, let's, let's bring out basically a floating conveyor belt so that the, the harvesters don't have to run to the very end. And this started coming out and growers started to adopt it and, and started to, to, to test it out. And what they found was that, um, you know, it was, it was, it was a good um, process. You can see that now that they're on a floating conveyor, and the, the harvesters can now just run over. Um, they, they can also pick up their new, um, you know, uh, flats and, and clamshells, what we call them, the plastic containers. And then they, can, they don't have to run all the way to the end of the field. They can, they can kind of, you know, optimize their um, time motion here. Um, so uh, it seemed to be working pretty well. But even this, it, it kind of just makes... It just, like a lot of the growers, they, the reason they started to adopt this because it just made sense. You know, it's like, well, that, that's pretty easy form of technology to do the adoption. But, you know, even with this, um, uh, what we found was that, you know, on face value, uh, you, get, you can decrease the amount of workforce you need from 20, a, a, a crew size of 25 and then bring it down to 15 and then also pick the, um, uh, pick the same amount of fruit. Um, and that sounds like on paper, I think, you know, there could be, um, uh, you know, entire research proposals submitted to, to, to achieve these types of results. Um, and, uh, but, but what we found is that, you know, yeah, there's, there's maintenance, capital costs, um, you know, storaging of the machines, these, these minor things that the grower needs to now change. Um, but with really the hurdle, this, this took about five years to even get, you know, um, it's it's got moderate traction now. It's not completely, it's not all inclusive, but it's a, a you know moderate traction. But the the issues were the people. You know, the the people you're working with, um, um, your crew. You know, the noise, the pace, the workload, the ergonomics. I mean, now you have to now you have a crew. Let's say you're a strawberry farmer of uh, 500 acres. You have about a crew size of a thousand people, and now you have a machine out there, and now you have to find uh, uh, 15 people who pick at the same rate, who are about the same height because everything's ergonomic, and then uh, don't mind the noise and also are willing to pick about 60% more fruit. Um, you have to take a little bit of cost. You pay them 80 cents on the dollar to, uh, to cover the cost of the, the machine, and then you give them 60% uh, more fruit so they make about $1.30 off of their original dollar. Um, but then you have to think about yeah, they make more money, but that's a lot more work, you know, that you're that you're putting onto the onto this crew. So then you have this, you add this coordination effort onto onto your um, your management program. So there there are difficulties there, but you know, even something as trivial as this, and I think this is why you're seeing in, in ag, you know, especially in, in specialty crops and and and, and uh, high intensive crops, you're seeing very little traction on technology. Um, really taking over and changing and changing the industry. Um, and I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that, you know, something as simple as this still takes, you know, three to five years to, to, to change. Um, so again, you know, um, the, the learning lessons here was um, basically uh, your, your, highest, your highest cost, your labor, is also um, some of the, the most important to, to get technology adoption. 
So it's your, your talent acquisition, your development and retention. You know, um, the, the grower, you know, although, you know, passively you might say like, oh yeah, I can, I can do this, I can do that. But really when it comes down to it, um, the, the worker, their, their labor force is going to tell them, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm either going to do this or I'm not. And, and you're going to, uh, uh, if you adopt it, it doesn't matter to me because I'm either just going to do it or, 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 or not. And they'll, they'll walk off if they don't like um, the new practice um, that, you're, that you're trying to implement. Um, so that was uh, really telling as well. You know, that's something that re- I think doesn't get the attention or the appreciation from entrepreneurs that are trying to enter the, the, the space. How much the growers, uh, how much input the, the workforce has on, on technology adoption. So then we also have, um, you know, uh, what we call crosshole punching. Um, so this is a practice where essentially um, these are the, the strawberry beds and you have to push those bare roots, which we saw earlier, into the, into the earth. And um, some growers, they like to open up the, uh, the, these holes because it's easy to put a, a, um, perpen- a parallel hole into the ground, but it's hard to not disturb the earth and also open up the plastic a little bit larger for water ingress and, and to make a, uh, to help out your plant establishment. So they send a, a workforce into it. And this was developed over here at Cal Poly. Um, basically a little couple of tines uh, mounted to the tractor and then they use their exist, retrofitted onto their existing hole puncher. Um, it kind of just uh, opens up, it, 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 it tears or drags on the plastic just slightly enough to create the, uh, the, uh, the holes that they're looking for. So this is another question. This was just created this year um, by uh, our, our Cal Poly team, and it, it cost the grower about fifty to hundred dollars um, an acre to uh, to do this operation. But it's another question: Do you think this will get adopted, you know, in the industry? <coughs> yeah, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because you know, it's before the production practice; it's retrofitable onto their current machine. And uh, 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 it seems like you know it, it, a lot of it. A lot of it just um, uh, it gives the grower also more options. Um, but what what we did find, and we believe it will get adopted. Um, but we what we just did a test about a couple weeks ago, and what we found from the grower was really interesting as well. What we found was that like you know originally there was two things. Originally the grower said, yeah, if you punch seventy um, percent of the holes, eighty percent of the holes and you miss the other ones, um, that's okay, because we'll send in a crew after. You saved me you know, 80% of my crew's time, something along those lines. Um, but now, you know, as labor starts to get scarce, and they don't have crew, and the scenario changes, and again, this is, it's always been changing. Um, now they don't have crew. Now the question is, um, if you punch 80% of the holes, uh, and I don't have the crew to fix the, to open up the other 20%, now I'm going to have kind of a wavy field. You're going to have plant establishment that's really um, aggressive and the ones that have open holes and the ones that are not are going to be a little bit lag- laggard. So, I mean, uh, uh, and that just, they, they don't, that, that changes, um, it actually affects their workforce. How, um, if the workforce sees a, a wavy, um, you know, uh, not pristine looking field, they're just going to move over to the, to, to the grower that has a pristine field with more fruit. So, you know, it's attracting the workforce. So that's interesting. And then also what we found was that uh, the current operator of the, uh, of the uh, hole puncher, you know, drives at about, he ranges his, his driving speed from three miles per hour to six miles per hour because uh, there is a, a planting crew following him. And he needs to open up the hole right before the planting crew gets there so that the hole doesn't dry out. Um, so now you have this variable speed going throughout the, the field, and that needs to be ac- uh, accounted for too. But those are two, you know, lessons where you know one was that originally the technology was uh, approached as a uh, um, any sort of savings would be a direct savings to the grower, and then it became an all or nothing, a go no go technology. And then that was you know from a technologist, which I'm, I'm glad this was you know. This is why we, we do this here at Cal Poly because uh, if, if we hired a team and spent you know a million dollars or something on this, and then the expectation, which is which has happened, the expectation goes from um, oh you need eighty percent to you need a hundred percent, or it's a a, a non uh, a non starter. Uh, that's a fundamentally different that's a fundamentally different technology. The entire technology process changes. 
So that's something that was interesting as well, that, that growers, that growers just, you just find these things out. And then we also tested all sorts of stuff, you know, bicycle systems. It was too big and also unstable enough. And we also had a combine system, which was great, but, you know, it worked on sandy soil, but not silty or clay. Um, and then there was also um, different types of uh, bed formation that, that, that was also, we found that, you know, those were also um, uh, reasons why we uh, uh, couldn't get this adopted by the um, uh, general grower. So, um, you know, all of these aspects, uh, and, and again, this is what's great working out here at Cal Poly, is that you can kind of go, we went through 15 iterations of this hole puncher um, with students and staff um, to, uh, to understand what would and would not get adopted, what would actually change the industry. Um, and then you also have, you know, in terms of the, uh, not only when you add like a, a blade system, you have like drip lines. Some people use two lines, three lines, four lines, and if you nick a drip line, then you're, there's no, there's no way they're going to adopt it. So um, these are all, you know, concerns. Um, here's another one that, you know, what we have here is um, hoop house production, um, basically trying to control the environment slightly, um, but you have to disassemble and reassemble this each time, and then you have labor staff that go out and these uh, hoops are actually under spring tension. You actually have to compress them and put them onto the, the post. So they're trying to remove it, but at the same time, it's, it's near, it's above your, your core position. So it becomes a pretty labor-intensive um, task. So this one's, this one's here was a master's student uh, at Cal Poly and uh, designed a, a system to try to uh, remove it and then have uh, a separate forklift system or tractor system um, um, nest them at, at a later point. Um, but they basically used um, uh, large dome structures to apply some pressure on the, on the um, uh, hoops while um, uh, pushing them upwards to, to relieve them. So this was, a, a, again, a master's student, and um, uh, it was a sponsored project from the grower. Um, the grower specifically, um, there are some projects that are like the Ligus vacuum, which is, uh, benefits the entire industry. So that's more a grower um, uh, commission-funded project. And then there are projects that maybe benefit a subsection. Not everybody has hoops, for instance. And then some growers just uh, sponsor that outright directly. Um, so you can see that um, as the uh, uh, wheel goes through, it kind of lifts it off the, the posts. Maybe another question, do you think, how, how, how likely do you think this could get adopted? You know, what, what are the concerns when you're, looking at the, when you're looking at it from a grower's perspective? Yeah, so I mean, this one is really new. This was just a, a couple of weeks ago that, that we had, um, uh, we did this test out. Uh, we're definitely, I think at this point for us, uh, internally at the Cal Poly Strawberry Center, we think that it demonstrated enough proof of concept that it will we'll probably take us two years to get it to, to a point where the growers can adopt it. Um, but, uh, uh, and then you have to demonstrate proof of value, which is... Um, uh, how you get a grower to actually um, do the adoption. And proof of concept and proof of value, sometimes people don't even talk about proof of value. In terms of ag tech, a lot of companies have been purchased without demonstrating proof of value, only proof of concept. Um, so it's interesting um, in that regard as well. Um, and then here's, a, here's another one. This is um, um, strawberry processing. So your jams, juice, and jellies, you can see this individual there. Um, he basically collected five strawberries, had them all in his hand, and then oriented them in such a way that he could remove the, uh, the, the leaf off the strawberry with a mandolin. Um, and then now they're trying to um, automate this. Of course, you can imagine that this is hard work, and it's also time-consuming. And now they're trying to automate this process um, with uh, um, taking the fruit. So they just pick it like they normally would pick fruit, send it into um, the production facility, and then um, have some sort of um, uh, pick, and, pick and place or a delta arm to, uh, to uh, remove the calyx. Um, so maybe uh, along with this, this one is actually, uh, we've been working on for about, uh, about 10 years now to get industry-wide adoption on this. This would be hundreds of millions saved to the industry. Um, and it would change a lot of the, um, it would, the good things is that the, late, the current labor force, they hate doing this process. <laughs> so, like, uh, you could really, again, you know, with the mindset of your labor force is your, a happy worker is a happy company. Um, you know, this is also benefits in that regard as well. 
Um, so, um, I mean, you can just imagine your hands are sticky, there's flies all around you, it's crazy. But, um, uh, so, um, uh, do you think this can get adopted? You know, um, I already mentioned it, we've been working on it for 10 years, but, you know, um, do you think this could get adopted? Yeah, I think yeah, I think so. I mean, right now the funny thing is like we approached this originally with the growers and they said just give us something that gives us the speed we need. So then we got something that was producing like 144 strawberries a second. Um and it was a footprint of 4 by 8. And then it it, it was hitting uh, uh but it was about 80% of what a human human parity what a human could do. So then it didn't get adopted. And that took like three years and multiple millions of dollars to, to determine that, uh, that, that, that insight. Um, and then now um, the, the second approach is, okay, now let's, well, what we also learned from the grower was that speed was just based on the current mindset of I don't want to change anything in my factory. But then when you talked about the value proposition and, and how much could be saved by removing, um, uh, by doing this uh, autonomously, the, co- the conversation then shifted to, oh, yeah, I can just uh, buy another warehouse and set up a new facility just for this. And that was, you know, just those things that, you know, I, you, know you wish you could extract in an easier manner. But it takes to the point where everyone is uh, fully integrating this into their, into their um, uh, you know, how uh, doing the analysis of how I would actually adopt this to you actually get those, um, those, 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 uh, those insights. Um, and then, so now we have something that instead of 144 strawberries a second, this is like two and a half strawberries a second. But it can do it what a, what a human can do. And then now we see, now we're seeing like a, a lot more interest in, in actually raising the capital to to, to make this adoption. Um, so from there, you know, what was what was also something that we should mention is that uh, when you're looking at the technology. Um, you know, is it a cost savings or is it a revenue generator or, and, and also the, the value chain? So for that processing element there, um, there's two, two entities in, in the strawberry industry. There are growers and there are processors. And there are some people who own the vertical that own, that own everything. Um, but, uh, you know, from a, a grower standpoint, this might look like a, a cost savings. And from a, 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 a processor standpoint, this might look like a revenue generation because then you can get more, more product into your facility. And typically, revenue generation works out the most. Um, it works out the best. But when you have that disparity and the value is being distributed across the chain, what we find is that it's difficult. Uh, there, becomes a, there becomes a sticking point, a friction point, where someone has to make the capital expenditure and who is it going to be because the value is being distributed across multiple parties and it might be, uh, you know, contentious um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the relationship. So, uh, you know, from there, you know, it's kind of who, who extracts the most value, tries to, tries to do it. But again, you're trying to battle that uh, avoid doing anything new uh, mentality. So it's a, uh, but what we find is that in, in, if your product, if your technology ex- ex- extends the value chain, there's, there's going to be quite a bit of conflict and delay through that process. But if you could say this only benefits you as a grower, like that floating conveyor belt, you can be like, okay, um, I can wrap my head, head, head around it. And the grower says, I need to make that investment. It's very clear for the team. Um, yeah. And then uh, there's a um, strawberry runner cutting which is starting to uh, get some attention. So this is the, the current practice going through and uh, cleaning up the bed, cutting these runners. Runners, basically a strawberry plant, tries to propagate clonally, so it sends out a runner. It looks like a stem. If the runner hits the ground, a new strawberry plant will start to grow. But you don't want that to happen. You want all the energy to go into fruit production. So you have to cut off these runners before they, um, before they start to suck up energy. Um, so then you have um, uh, this approach here. So, I'm, you know, maybe another question. Do you think this could be adopted? Yeah, I get a lot of uh, head shaking. I, I would say, yeah, it does make a lot of sense. You know, this costs about $3,000 an acre to do this operation uh, each season. So it's pretty, uh, that turns into like a $100 million problem to the, just California alone. Um, so, um, you know, this probably could be done because it, it's, not, it's not like fruit where you have to pick it within, like, hours, if not within one day. This can be done maybe six times a year, um, plus or minus a month, 
and it could be done um, uh, outside of the, uh, um, the the current production practice um, um, systems. It's a possibility, but you you what you what you hope that you hope you don't run into is that a grower says it's an all or nothing. You know, you have to do it as good as a um, um, uh, one of their uh, uh, cleaning crews, or or I can't adopt it at all. Which we don't think that's going to happen, but that's always a concern. Especially you know, the more we learn, the more we're concerned. And then uh, this, is, I, I just bring this up because um, a lot of people think of when they enter the strawberry industry, the first thing they start to learn is like these general production curves. Like in California, we're able to produce strawberries like 10, uh, 10 months out of the year. You can argue even 12 months out of the year. Majority is in the, um, the purple is the total production. And then each of these uh, green, red, blue are district by district. Those three dots you saw earlier. And then uh, when people start to look into the industry, they start creating their own economic models and, and they start designing their equipment to conform to these, um, um, these uh, production curves. Um, which, you know, I, I think the, the, the intention is correct, but um, in the end what we find is that there's a, a, a disconnect between the, the resolution that's required. So one is that, you know, people start to, they, they, they try to do, um, you know, one task. Like, let's say it's, a, you know, harvesting, for instance. Um, they try to do one task, and then they, they, they say, like, you know, uh, I can save you X amount of labor, et cetera. Um, but in, in the end, uh, uh, you know, your, your uh, labor force, you know, let's say you solve the picking problem, but then there's packing and quality assessment. And not only that, your labor force that you acquire, um, you know, they're multitask. And we talked about this. That same labor force that you're getting to pick your fruit, is also cleaning your field. They're uh, decapping your fruit. They're uh, you know doing all these other operations um, uh, 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 outside of their um, uh, outside of their main um, you know um, acquisition to to do um, to pick the fruit, and that leads us to like overhead. You know what's overhead and what's actual um, savings uh, when you start to put it to it. So um, this is the uh, production curve, not of uh, a district or of the entire California industry. This is the production curve off of one farm. So off of one farm, and you can see each day there's about you know 2,000 pounds an acre that needs to be uh, removed. So a really uh, you know um, a clairvoyant uh, grower could create like a a, produ a a labor pool which they have to grow each year. They have to find the labor to do this job. So they can probably do it something like um, uh, they can try to match their production curve so that they always have enough labor to meet the amount of fruit that needs to be taken out of the field. But then what, what happens in this 20-day period? Do, are you able to like furlough your 1,000-person your staff and, and you know, go about it? But no, you have to keep that labor. So then everything underneath the curve, the disparity between these two, from a farmer's perspective, from a specific grower, they're going to think of that as overhead. And then when you're, so a lot of the times when the technologists come in, they're, they're surprised because they're like, why are growers changing their mind all the time? Well, one, one month they're saying, oh, you're saving me money. The next month you're saying, no, you're not saving me anything. I can't use this at all. It's because it just depends where, you, where you're located in, in the season at the time. So it's, uh, you know, those are the questions that um, um, I think uh, uh, if uh, more attention was brought to, you could save quite a bit of uh, money. Some money, money is not spent twice. And I, I like to conclude with uh, you know a, um, uh, a meeting I went to just just last week um, at Automate Detroit. I'm not sure if anyone uh, attended it, but um, essentially it's the largest automation ex, uh, conference in, in uh, North America. And they show all these sorts of exhibits and, and technologies there. Um, and you're looking at. Uh, 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 some of them here, um, and it's uh, uh, really a sight to see. So I'd actually recommend it it's, um, uh, uh, for any on a technical staff or on a, on a future or visionary staff or a strategy staff. They, uh, it's all really interesting. So you're seeing quite a bit of food, agriculture, robotics. Um, they, they view agriculture as a burgeoning uh, market, burgeoning vertical. So quite a bit of them are opening up. Um, and then you see all these new tests. So, like when I saw this, I thought of strawberries. I was like, "Oh wow, could we do something there? You know, can I pack or 
something I'm not, you know, just thinking you have all these like uh, co-robotics and, and arms and delta arms and, and act multi-axis arms and just thinking like how can we apply this to our field, um, you know. Um, and and for, for, for me and my colleagues, you know, when we go to these conferences, you know, at this point, when we first went to the conference, we, you know, when, when we were just entering the industry, you know, when we saw this, we saw, like, there was, like, infinite possibility. You know, we could do so much with, uh, uh, with the technology currently available off the shelf, and, and, and we could change our industry. And then we went to the conference, like, more and more, and then, you know, you, you, you go back to your internal, internal organization. You do, like, a strength, weakness, opportunities, threats, analysis, and, and then you come back to the conference, and then you figure out, like, okay, this is like a, a shopping mall. Now I'm prepared. Now I know my industry. And you can start to buy the products to, to fit the needs you have. But, but now when we come to these, these conferences, we look at it as kind of like a casino, where each of these vendors, because you've now invested quite a few, you know, hundreds, uh, millions of dollars on, on these um, technologies, and some of them pay off and some of them don't. So that's kind of, um, you know, a thought that, that I'll leave you with. But, you know, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully we, uh, we can think about some more um, topics before we go down the road of technology adoption, more concerns to consider. So thank you.